am deeply impressed with uh, this kind of a crowd of executives of a public sector corporation interested in social science related issues and willing to listen to an outsider who would certainly speak on esoteric issues but nonetheless that interest that you show to be conversant with uh, social and uh, labor related issues is something very commendable and I'm very grateful for giving me this opportunity to talk to you on this topic, labor institutions and development. Let's not try to make it complex. Essentially what we are trying to look into is, or what we would like to look into is, um, about labor laws, labor regulations prevalent in the country. And we ask a question, do they serve any purpose? Do they stand in the way of economic development? As we are all, many of us are prone to thinking. Because there is a very influential body of public opinion which holds the view that labor laws, insofar as they are present in India, have stood in the way of economic development. And we shall try to take a look at this. And to this end, we will take a brief look at the past history of labor legislation and come to more contemporary times and therefore um, try to assess their impact. But then a little bit of clarification about the kind of terms that we will use in this lecture. One, labor, the other, institutions, and the third, development. I mean, we all know how to define it, but then to, 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 to make it more familiar to you, let me say that we all belong to that category of people who participate in the production of marketable goods and services in return for either income or wages. That's the way we include ourselves in the category of the labor force. Let me also say, those of us who technically are retired from the labor force, for instance, me, um, wouldn't, again, come for strict category of, for inclusion in the category of labor force, that's for technical reasons. But then, uh, what are the institutions we talk about? They are um, the laws and regulations and the administrative structure created at the instance of the state for surveillance of the labor market. Um, that is to facilitate, to supervise, and to regulate the functioning of labor markets. You might as well raise a question, is there a case for doing that? But that's a separate set of issues. And then when we come to the term development, that's another generic term we often come across. It's an expression for improvement in the living standards of people that goes along with a rise in national income, which we are all used to measuring all over the world in per capita terms. And these three terms, let me say, are very interrelated. They go hand in hand, deriving synergy and support from each other as labor market changes in terms of its size and composition, qualitative changes take place in the content of regulatory institutions. And we do expect that cumulatively they contribute to one way or the other, to raising the real living standards of the people. It's the parallel growth of these three aspects that we shall one way or the other, try to take a look at. 
again before going any further i will not be very long i mean i'll try to restrict myself to the time given still i if i ever tend to overshoot please just let me know um, uh, a feel of the numbers would be good for us that is another field we have a mind field with with a lot of definitional complications let me come to the simplest of the lot we take into account the usual status workers measured by the national sample survey organization and uh, there we also come across two distinct categories of workers those who belong to the formal organized sector that is the sector under the surveillance of the state and those of them who do not belong to that now in the formal or in the organized sector let me say there last time they counted that was in 2011-12 there were something like 29.8 million workers in that sector in the formal organized sector you belong to that category by the way and um, now we can stretch it extend it by including another category which is strictly speaking is not permissible that is to include those people who have a regular job in the non agricultural sectors of the economy excluding construction and where people are hired in establishments that if we include them they belong to both rural and urban areas and they come to something like 28 million uh, no, 38 million. So altogether, we are talking about an extended category of workers in the formal sector. Strictly speaking, the latter category does not belong to that. The first former category belongs to just 6% of the total labor force. That is, in out of a population of 1,200 million, something like 484 million people have been counted as workers. Among them, you have just less than 30% in the organized sector or in the formal sector. And they constitute 6% of the total labor force. And if we go for a very convoluted, extended definition of the organized sector, we have got something like 15, less than 15% of the total workforce covered by the institutional safeguards we love to complain about. What's the corresponding situation in Kerala? Just for information, it's something like this. We have a population of something like 33 million, of which we have a labor force measured according to the usual status concept. I don't go into the nuances of the concept. We have got something like 11.2 million workers, 11.8 million workers. Out of that, in the organized sector, we have 1.13 million. The organized sector, meaning those under the surveillance of the state uh, through its institutions of governance, they come to 1.13 million. And again, if we have an extended definition, which is, which is pretty hard to adopt in the Kerala context, that is taking into workers, people with a regular job in establishments, then we include another 1.8 million altogether, something like um, 2.5 million, 2.5 million, and they come to less than 25% of the total labor force of the state. If we take the organized, very core organized sector alone, there we have something like 10% of the total workforce slightly better than the all India average situation. Um, the size of the, you know, the point I wanted to say is that uh, the labor laws governing them did not drop from the sky. It's very much intrinsically part of the social history and political developments of the subcontinent. In the All India context, the earlier political leadership of the country, in particular the, the first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, was acutely aware of the sensitivities of the workforce, the importance, the crucial significance of getting, their, get their, getting them on board in the national mainstream 
for that it was important to have a panoply of rules and regulations that governed their working lives and it was with that intention that we formulated a set of rules and regulations from the repertoire of the international community um, there we have a long history of taking part in formulating i mean being involved in the development of regulatory instruments for governing a wide variety of aspects in the world of work and um, we took it from the kind of received wisdom that was already prevalent in the international community it was there in the aftermath of the um, of the of the world wars when the you know actually it, the the labor institutions of uh, developed world which we borrowed borrowed very much in lock stock and barrel and tried to transplant into the indian context and those labor institutions which developed in the industrialized world again has have had interesting antecedents they came in response to what we call the social question of europe the social question of europe is something it's a very painful phase in the evolution of um, european industrial societies the industrial revolution of the 18th 19th centuries was a very traumatic process the deprivation the misery the malnutrition the squalor and the degradation of the human beings that it came about, it 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 depicted and which you read about in the novels of the 19th century essentially raised this social question to the concern of many people they became extremely perturbed, perturbed about it and there was something like a corrosion of character of the traditional worker he lost his identity his individuality moved into the urban milieu wandered around without a secure income earning source and one way or the other that kind of a social explosion was um, was was round the corner on account of the kind of rising inequalities in the world of work and they created wonderful institutional safeguards at the fag end of it and it came with the kind of treaty of versailles in 1919 when the repositories of the collective wisdom of europe the members of the epistemic communities the social philosophers the moral philosophers social activists reformers they all came together and tried to give shape to institutions that would ensure a place for workers ever in history by making rules and regulations that are binding on mankind and it happened with the treaty they also gave birth to an organization the international labor organization which by the way was a tripartite democratic structure and for that reason it was unprecedented unheard of in those days that you give shape to an organization where representatives of workers governments and employers from all over the world came together they deliberated on the content of numerous conventions and recommendations governing the world of work name any aspect of your work there is a convention and but then these conventions were shaped up by the representatives of workers and employers and governments right from 1919 onwards and they together gave shape to a wonderful set of regulations governing the world of work and when india came of age with independence we could borrow straight from the repertoire of uh, the industrialized countries and create institutional safeguards but then there is a problem we adopted those institutions those instruments without necessarily ordering them this we had the kind of strange predicament 
of um, owning the instruments which were ordered elsewhere. And we also had a problem. We tried to adopt these regulations without necessarily passing through the transformation phase, which the West did go through. That is, they went through a tumultuous phase of urbanization, absorption of workers into the kind of industrial enterprises, went through an agony of um, living in misery and malnutrition. That entire progress to the road of prosperity was littered with blood and sweat of people in the industrializing world. Not just of the industrializing world, actually of the colonies too. And that's where a country like India came in. But then in the post-independence period, in the post-war years, when there was hope in the air, there was euphoria in the air, the idea of national buildup was seriously canvassed by the political leadership of the time. We took on these institutional safeguards without necessarily fulfilling the preconditions. We did not have a sizable urban threshold. We had something like more than 70% of the population living in rural areas, actually much more than that. We did not have the kind of category, sizable category of industrial workforce. We did not have significant representative organizations of employers and workers, people who could mobilize political opinion in support of a regulatory regime. All these shortcomings stood in the way. Nonetheless, we adopted these institutional safeguards in good faith. And many of us have been beneficiaries of that. But then what happened is, that sector to which we belonged, that organized sector, did not grow at all. It remained just about 30 million for several decades. And what actually happened is, the unorganized sector expanded. And the unorganized sector was known for non-observance of the rules of the game. People came in they were at the receiving end of employment relations. They were not necessarily governed by attractive terms and conditions. In fact, they never did. Many of them could easily be thrown out, except they were governed by some customary rules which certainly did not eliminate. So we generated a, an employment, we, we inherited an employment problem that was fundamentally unviable. Again, we had a major problem with population explosion. While in the West, they contained the growth of population because they had very low negative fertility rates, we were on an expanding streak. And which means within, within a few decades after the, the independence, we were faced with a situation of doubling of our labor force, doubling of our population, more than doubling of our labor force. All these things made situation fundamentally unviable. Again, let's go back to the West. They were becoming the beneficiaries of an institutionalized set of regulations which we tried to borrow lock, stock, and barrel. They belong to what is called the golden age of European economic growth. The 1950s and the 60s were when the social democratic regimes came together in Europe in collaboration with partnership of workers and employers, gave rise to the kind of wonderful institutions that secured the place of workers. They had something like labor market protection. While in India, we were struggling with employment protection for those who were already employed in the formal sector. We were bargaining to keep them employed with their limited employment opportunities. The problem, Europe really did overcome that. And they were moving to more advanced stages. They could go in for active labor market policies which enhance the content of benefits which workers received, strengthen the institutions of training, made it possible for them to move to higher skill categories, and the visible presence of the state dispensing welfare was there. 
an acknowledged fact. But they also did one thing. They put a stop on the migration of labor. They developed a kind of hostile attitude to any incoming labor stream, which continues right up to the time, because there was this presumption that if people come in from outside, they will be coming with the intention of scrounging on the welfare system. Something time and history will prove that they were wrong, but nonetheless, still there is a neg negative feeling to us. And this attitude towards the workers outside in the world, outside the European fold, continued. Therefore, their emphasis was basically not to encourage trade not to encourage economic growth of those countries because they realized any expansion of trade would come, take place at the disadvantage of workers already ensconced in privileged positions in the European part of the world. And this kind of conflict of interest continued. While in India, we went ahead with the kind of institutional safeguards. And what we did was we tried to dig our heels deeper as we encountered more problems. And we tried to create more regulations with the intention that they will substitute for real benefits. And there was all around discomfort, disagreement with the state of affairs. People tried to argue, listen, this will not go. These rules and regulations we have given shape to from the repertoire of the West are fundamentally unfriendly towards employment creation. And there's a very influential body of public opinion which still subscribes to it. And they are on the ascent. And with the net result, the classic case of our confusion, the Industrial Disputes Act of 1948, which was uh, amended in 1961, and later in 1976, all with the crucial provision that in any enterprise below, above the size of 100, that is in any, any enterprise hiring workers of size more than 100, you have to get special permission from the state before you uh, lay off workers or you, you close it down. And obviously, this was to propitiate the category of workers, trade unions, we thought we were protecting employment. And that continued an issue. And there's a, there's a huge amount of literature on this subject, people trying to argue from different perspectives, trying to say, look, we are instituting a system which is fundamentally unfriendly to economic growth. But I think it's time we got together and did a bit of public reasoning about the beneficial adverse effects of labor legislation. Let's face the fact, people are there in the world of work not looking for that lifetime, fixed time jobs. I mean, which is one effective way of ensuring whatever they aspire from the world of work. And their aspirations, by the way, are not all that large. It's a secure income during your life working time and also beyond the period of your working life. It's extremely important because once you are physically incapable of putting in work, there is a question of ensuring a stream of returns. Then there is a need for say, reasonable health care, good working environment, and if possible, support to the, to, the, to the members of the family. And these were the kind of demands which the workers always wanted. And then we always tried to link it with the, with the rise in cost of living. And the demands put forward by the, by the trade unions were always limited in scope. But then the fact of the matter is, the state, one way or the other, proved that it was not in a position to generate adequate income earning opportunities that could absorb more people into the organized sector. There it was a collective failure. There we failed on the front of infrastructural investments. We were very much victims of 
globalization, be focused on the kind of wrong industries. I mean, you know, barring a few exceptions in East Asia, the earlier round of countries that did well in, I mean, you know, India was just not there. And the 60s and the 70s, 50s and the 60s brought to the fore serious problems in on our employment front. We went ahead with the labor legislation, but then we did not have an expanding base of workers, employed, employed workers. And that we were not able to tackle. With the net result, the subterfuges started getting at work. Ways of circumventing the existing labor regulations were devised, operationalized, in spite of the presence of strong, um, I mean, you know, in, I mean, important pieces of legislation in states, in different states, you witnessed a systematic decline of the organized sector. The entire textile industry of uh, Western India was decimated with very little upward mobility taking place. They were all technologically restructured. And we moved on to other sectors. That's, I'm not denying the fact that the state assumed, but then that came only during the period of economic liberalization from the 1990s onwards. Up to that time, we had something like the lost decades, something, a period which Professor Raj Krishna uh, of yesteryears called something that corresponded to he used a pejorative expression, but I think he made sense at that time. He called it the Hindu rate of growth, meaning whatever we do, we never grow at more than 3% rate. Things changed much later. As our economies got opened up to the globalization phase, and there, there, increase in employment took place, but much of that increase in employment took place outside the organized sectors. And we are perturbed about this development of an enormous increase in employment in the manufacturing sector, but then they're all absorbed as contract workers. There's an enormous increase in employment in the private sector taking place, but they all come under the category of informal sector. The, the group I mentioned about people who have got a, 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 a regular job in an enterprise, in a hiring establishment, in the non-agricultural sectors, they belong to that category. But then one doesn't know much about the terms and conditions on which they are hired. You know, the point I'm trying to make is it's time we stopped harboring delusions about the revival of the organized sector. I think it's time we created a set of institutions that can take care of the interests of workers in the expanding informal sector. Make sure that their aspirations are taken care of. That means a secure income during their working time, life and also beyond that. A reasonable health care, acceptable working conditions. These are instances in which the state can come to the fore, create regulatory institutions. More importantly, make sure that we invest considerably in skill development of the people, working on the supply side of the market, making it possible for them to acquire employment and income mobility in the markets. And then make sure that we, one way or the other, create social insurance institutions that can take care of what's called the requirement, the aspirations for a secure life after your retirement. Which means the state can come for to create a reasonable provident fund or an annuity leading to an income stream for their pension benefits. Together with health insurance benefits, these are eminently possible. 
and to make every worker in the unorganized sector entitled to that. Create the kind of a national identity system, ident I mean, you know, identity card system, wherein your entitlements, irrespective of the duration of employment, irrespective of the place of work, become portable. You move whenever you change. And then also the state come to the fore creating contributory unemployment insurance institutions. It's not a free for all affair. It's not as if the state is going to provide unemployment, unemployment benefits to people who lose jobs. Let it be made a contributory affair. Now it's possible to work actuarially or actuarially work out the kind of finance required to provide a sound social security system in the unorganized sector and make it possible for them to attain mobility in the markets and the state assume a role for facilitating, supervising, regulating a redistributive order in labor markets. It's well within the reach of the policy community. And I think it's time all of us gave a lot more attention to what Professor Amartya Sen used to say, public reasoning on these issues. Make it possible for people to come forth with ideas to see whether it works or not. And there are instances where it worked. Certainly it did in the West. There is no such arbitrary distinction between organized and unorganized sectors there in the West. And I think what we should truly do is essentially to strengthen the entitlements and uh, income intake of people in the unorganized sector. For that, the state can contribute to building a floor price. That comes through the medium of social spending. Kerala is one instance, by the way, whether we like it or not, there is a sizable share of public expenditure wasted of course but nonetheless going into the social sectors into education into healthcare which in the past created the kind of a foundation which enabled people to talk about a reserve price that's one reason why we have still possibly one of the highest wage rates in the entire subcontinent all those migrant workers coming into Kerala, besides being drawn by the kind of income from migrant remittance flows, it's also influenced by the fact that there is a floor price prevalent in the state, which has been heavily influenced by the pattern of social spending. And this is a model, this is a pattern which can be adopted in the rest of India. What I'm trying to say is it's time we gave more attention to these issues and tried to work out solutions that would provide answers to make life more secure for people in the unorganized sectors, make them partners in the development process. And that's something well within the reach of our political community. Thank you. I would like to know what is the status of migrant labor in other countries or how they are treated, especially uh, with respect to the recent response in our state about the rights of uh, migrant labor, which is being disputed by one section of uh, people thinking why the state exchequer should spend on protecting the rights of the migrant labor. Uh, and their loyalty is elsewhere, their income is going elsewhere. Should we spend from our kitty and protect them? On the other side, uh, many trade unions are trying to organize them, to protect their rights. My, uh, the question, or rather, what I would like to know is how this issue is treated in other countries based on your ILO experience. Let me say, in Kerala, all this tall talk about protecting the migrant workers it, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it probably gives political returns, but then let's face the fact, neither the state nor the rest of India has an institutional framework or an infrastructural framework 
to record the flow of migrant workers. Many of them coming in have, do not have the kind of puppy, the, the, the records in their hands. And then to constitute a welfare fund for them and say that those of them who become members and contribute will be entitled to a certain amount of benefits at the end of their going back. I mean, there is the, there is the, the migrant workers welfare fund in Kerala. We have, we have something like 28 welfare funds and uh, we have tried to take care of the interest by saying that those of them who make regular membership contributions will be entitled to benefits. Fact of the matter is, they're just not there to take membership. They're not just there to contribute because we lack an institutional framework a, to enlist them, B, to collect their membership. They are migrant birds. They move from place to place in search of casual jobs. And there is no way they can be brought under the umbrella of any regulatory institution, at least for the time being, unless, unless we evolve the kind of data entry system based on their national ID cards and register them as beneficiaries of, of entitlement, I mean, as people entitled to benefits. Problem is, we don't have a system of benefiting our own casual workers. The Agricultural Workers Act was making very tall promises. Fact of the matter is, at the end, we just ended up giving those of them who survived with 400 rupees a month, which is not a living income. So my, my contention is we are still not technically in a situation to account for them, to make provisions for them, to have a fund which will distribute benefits to them. The only way it can be done is to have a national a registry of workers wherein wherein your entitlements are recorded. But then for that, for entitlements to be recorded, the employer community should be as much willing. All these people, they come and work with private employers or contractors. Unless we have a system of paying for their provident fund allocation and their health care benefits and their pension savings irrespective of the duration of employment, that's what I meant, irrespective of the location of work. We just don't have a system as yet. And there's no point in talking about it unless the polity comes together and, and agree it's to make, institute a regulatory system. Without that, we are at a disadvantage. And this is exactly the problem uh, in Europe too, where the migratory movements are heavily monitored, certainly not from the developing world. All those poor guys who, who drown in the Mediterranean Sea or in the Canary, in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, in a desperate bid to reach Europe, they're looking for a secure income source. They're not going as welfare scroungers. They're not going, they're not even remotely planning to live on the welfare state. But the fact of the matter is, the European system is so fundamentally hostile to the interests of migrant workers. Do you feel that the labor laws should be too liberal or, um, or it should be too harsh? In what way, what is your experience in different countries? That uh, what kind of uh, labor laws are, uh, you can say, that uh, idealistic or uh, from economic development? The labor institutions embodying labor laws came in Europe at the fag end of development. I mentioned to you that path, that road to prosperity was littered with blood and sweat of people. They fought hard for every bit of the wonderful labor legislation, labor law that you see in the West. But in the process, their predecessors, their ancestors paid a heavy price. And that led to the, to, the, to the evolution of a set of regulatory norms. Secure jobs, rigid hours of work, abolition of child labor, 
improved safety standards, uh, day of rest, all these things came only in the 1920s. Prior to that, Europe never had, well, they had it, but then they were in the making. But in India, I mean, overwhelmed by the, the kind of phenomenal success which they displayed, because an affluent society also followed a very high set of labor standards. We straight away tried to adopt them. I mean, there is an argument that it was imposed on us, but then let's not go into that. But the fact of the matter is, we were motivated by the highest ideals. And in the process, tried to transplant these institutions into our context without fulfilling the preconditions that were there in the West. A very high rate of urbanization, an industrially advanced um, lab of, I mean, uh, in, an advanced industrial sector which accounted for a large share of the output, <coughs> both in manufacturing and in services, a systematically declining primary sector, facility for mobility of people into the urban milieus, all these things made it possible for people to move into better paying, secure, durable jobs in Europe, which were supported by the trade union organizations. And right from the beginning, the organized labor followed a strategy of minimizing competition among the workers. That's why they created this labor laws so that workers did not undercut each other. But then, by the time Europe adopted these regulations, which America did not, by the way, they were already in a much better position. And now when we tried to transplant these institutions, what was missing was a corresponding expansion of the economy. The kind of growth we expected would certainly take care of it, which was there in the in the in the in, in the era of Nehru. I mean, hope and euphoria was there. We all hoped that we would be overcoming these problems, but then we were overtaken by events. I mean, you know, we became victims of a whole gamut of developments, which essentially got manifested in stagflation, that meaning st economic stagnation and uh, and very high rate of inflation inadequate development of the non-agricultural sectors of the economy, very tardy absorption of workers into these sectors. All these things put together, put through a spanner into the works. And if we try to put the blame on the, on the, 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 the labor laws, my argument against it is, listen, Whenever you wanted to fire a person, labor laws did not stand in the way. The entire steel industry was restructured. The entire textile industry was restructured. The jute industry disappeared. I mean, you know, numerous industries disappeared. Old occupations disappeared. New ones came. The entire growth of uh, the, 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 survey, the IT industry, by the way, is taking place in a completely unprotected environment. I mean, you know, but that's another issue which, which we need separate discussion about. The point is, the labor laws which safeguarded the interests of workers were ineffective uh, right through. And I think it's better to have some laws safeguarding the interests of workers, otherwise we certainly would end up in a lot of social disruption. As such, the world is witnessing a lot of a rise of inequalities in the world on account of returns from work. And if we are also trying to create a category of deprived, dispossessed citizens in the world of work, that can, that can certainly lead to a dangerous situation. <coughs> the workers in the West acquired these things and strengthened their democratic institutions put in place um, the, what are called procedural rights. And we just adopted these procedural rights in the aftermath of uh, independence in the years that followed. We constitutionalized them without necessarily passing through the transient stages. And I'm not trying to say that we did a wrong thing. 
we try to short circuit the processes but then there should have been as much emphasis on economic growth but then we were very much victims of the circumstances a whole array of forces worked against the interests of the developing world and i am not sure it's we can put blame on anyone i mean you know there's no point in trying to say that's because of the faulty legislation we did it in good faith with good intentions only thing is they failed to deliver the goods or rather we did not have a structure that eventually made it possible for the laws to become operational for the benefit of the entire polity Thank <music> you.